The artistic traditions of Africa cover an immense array of styles that display a remarkable diversity that reflect a multitude of peoples and cultures. The sheer magnitude of the African continent indicates the dangers of generalization. Africa is geographically larger than the U.S., India, China, and Europe combined. As of the present moment, Africa comprises 54 distinct countries collectively inhabited by over 1.2 billion people. In the northern regions of Africa, artistic expressions generally fall under the influence of Egyptian, Roman, or Islamic traditions. However, our focus will mostly center on sub-Saharan Africa, encompassing the territory situated south of the expansive Saharan Desert. Some of the most persistent misconceptions about Africa concern the physical environment. The entire continent is commonly visualized as covered with jungle or with desert. In fact, there is a gradation from one to the other. European encounters with Africans occurred during the period spanning the 15th to the 19th century. Initially, Europeans primarily limited their presence to coastal areas with notable instances such as the Portuguese engagement with the kingdoms of Benin in Nigeria and the Congo. However, as the Industrial Revolution unfolded, explorers driven by the pursuit of natural resources, labor, and territorial expansion, as well as European missionaries driven by the desire to convert souls, gradually ventured deeper into the heartlands of Africa. The introduction of imported religions also had an impact, altering the traditional practices of spirit reverence and ancestor worship within local communities. From 1885 to 1924, European powers engaged in the process of partitioning Africa, establishing European colonies across the continent. Even after World War II, colonialism persisted with the majority of African nations only achieving independence in the early 1960s. Today, no part of Africa is entirely out of touch with the rest of the world. And the materialistic values of Western society, which are its easiest to export, are almost everywhere replacing the traditional spiritual ones. Humanity originated in Africa. For many years, the renowned Paleolithic cave art discovered in Europe caused experts to believe that human creativity emerged approximately 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. However, a significant breakthrough occurred in 1991 when archaeologists unearthed several artifacts at the Blombos Cave situated along the southern coast of South Africa. These artifacts were found to be over 70,000 years old. In addition to tools made from bone and stone and beads made from shells, they discovered pieces of ochre engraved with complicated designs. Ochre is an iron ore that is usually used to provide color to decorations. These ochre pieces may be the world's oldest artwork. This discovery challenged the previous notion and expanded our understanding of the origins and timeline of human creative expression. In Namibia, the oldest scientifically dated figurative rock art in Africa are the Apollo 11 plaques, which date back to approximately 26,000 to 28,000 years ago. These constitute the earliest examples of representational art discovered on the continent. In the Sodilo Hills in Botswana, there are an estimated 4,500 ancient rock paintings at the site that are believed to have been created by the ancestors of the San and the Bantu peoples. Some of the rock paintings have been dated to as early as 24,000 years before present. Located in a rock shelter in Tassili, Niger, Algeria, the running horned woman created between 6,000 and 4,000 BCE is a remarkably graceful yet dynamic testament to the artistry of early African rock art. Because most ancient African art was created from perishable materials, little remains from before the 13th century. However, in 1928, 10 miners working in central Nigeria stumbled upon some of the oldest surviving examples of sub-Saharan art, the renowned figures associated with the Nok culture. Archaeological evidence indicates that these works, of which hundreds have been found, date from the first millennium BC, the time of the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Made from terracotta, the figures range from a few inches high to nearly life-size. Their finely carved hair ornaments and facial features show that these figures were worked with the clay in a semi-hard state through carving and subtraction rather than modeling. This suggests that there may have been wood carving in that region which influenced the style. 
The vivid facial expression of the head makes it seem like a portrait of an individual, but at the same time there's a degree of abstraction in the treatment of the eyes and nose. Little else has survived from the knot culture, and although not much is known about it, its art seems to have heavily influenced other cultures of West Africa as the figures were traded across a wide area. The Lindenberg head, which was buried around 500 CE, is one of several terracotta sculptures from the early Bantu-speaking peoples in southern Africa. The decorative motifs show a great continuity with Bantu figures and decorations across large areas of Africa. The column-like necks are defined by large sculpted rings. Little is known about the ancient culture that produced them, but necks ringed with fat have been and continue to be viewed as a sign of prosperity by many African peoples. Advanced works of art were cast in bronze and other metals in West Africa as early as the 9th and 10th century CE by artists from Igbo Ukwu, a town in southern Nigeria. This equestrian figure on a flywhisk hilt and this roped water pot on a stand were both discovered at a burial site and attest to the sophistication of bronze works in this early period. For some nine centuries, artists in West Africa have created beautiful sculptures. These talented sculptors have honed their skills in various materials such as ceramics and ivory, but their expertise in bronze work is particularly renowned. Two significant cities, Ife and Benin, situated in present-day southwestern Nigeria, held great significance as centers for sculpture production. From approximately 1100 to 1400 CE, Ife thrived as a prosperous trading hub and was inhabited by the Yoruba people who continue to reside in the region to this day. The first recognition of Ife's unique and remarkable artistry outside of Nigeria in the modern era emerged in the early 20th century. A German anthropologist named Leo Frobenius spearheaded a journey to West Africa and visited Ife. In 1910, for several weeks, Frobenius conducted excavations, unearthing numerous terracotta and stone heads. However, he also encountered a brass head, which locals claimed represented Olukun, the Yoruba god of the sea. Fascinated by the discovery, Frobenius captured a photograph of the brass Olukun head for inclusion in his book, The Voice of Africa. The sight of this astonishing brass artwork left Frobenius utterly bewildered as he struggled to fathom how the people of Ife could have crafted such a sophisticated object. In 1910, it was generally thought that Africans primarily carved sculptures that were characterized by jagged, angular features and were extremely unrealistic. But the Ife head displayed such a level of mastery and naturalism that it rivaled the finest works of the Greeks and Romans. This was a profound surprise to Europeans who believed naturalism in art was considered the high point of civilization. This led them to dismiss the idea that Africans themselves could create such works. In an attempt to explain the existence of these sculptures from Ife, Frobenius proposed a novel idea. He suggested that this could be evidence of a Greek civilization going so far as to argue that it supported the existence of Atlantis and that the sculptures were remnants of a Greek colony. In January 1938, excavation work began for a new residential building situated in close proximity to the royal palace of the king, or Oni, of Ife. As the construction progressed, a remarkable find emerged from the site. A total of 18 sculptures were unearthed, with several of them resting just a few feet beneath the surface. The identification and function of these works remain uncertain. The heads clearly portray people of status and authority, possibly a king of Ife. Traces of the original red and black pigments can still be seen on the elaborate beaded headdress adorned with a feathered fringe. The male portrait head demonstrates the Ife skill in bronze using the lost wax method, which uses a seven-step casting process that uses molten metal. The thin-walled, hollow metal castings suggest the highest technological advancements achieved over many generations. Grooved lines of scarification emphasize facial contours. Rows of small holes probably held a beaded veil or hair. These magnificent sculptures from unknown artists were compared to the work of the great Italian Renaissance sculptor Donatello. It was even said that little that Greece, Italy, or Egypt ever produced could be finer. 
The sight of such a large group of refined naturalistic work had a profound effect on Europeans as the appeal of the work is immediate and universal. These sculptures from Ife are now rightfully recognized as among the most remarkable achievements in African art and culture. The artistic tradition of Ife exerted a significant influence on the sculptural arts of its neighboring region, Benin. The royal head of Inoba depicts another court style developed in Benin, which was somewhat abstract in comparison to the naturalism of Ife portrait sculpture. This head has a circular space on top in which an elaborately carved ivory tusk was placed. The art of bronze casting in Benin had a singular purpose, to exalt and honor the king or Oba. This intricate craft remained an exclusive domain guarded closely as a secret, with only royal artisans permitted to practice it. The majority of Benin's bronze heads depict royalty or esteemed ancestors, and they were often placed in altars to be maintained by subsequent generations. Among the various art forms that effectively capture the intersection of art, history, and Benin are the bronze plaques that adorned the royal palace. These plaques depict a wide range of individuals, including kings, warrior chiefs, priests, musicians, officials, servants, and animals. Additionally, several plaques portray the Portuguese explorers who first came to Benin in the 15th century. The presence of a plaque depicting the Oba holding leopards implies his extraordinary strength beyond the natural realm. Adorned in ceremonial attire, including a tall helmet and neck rings, he gazes at us with all-seeing eyes. Hanging from his belt are two mudfish, symbolic of his royal authority alongside the water deities that sustain all life. With a commanding gesture, he lifts two leopards by their tails, signifying his dominion over nature. Strategically placed on the exterior of the palace, these plaques serve as a public display conveying the divine powers possessed by the ruler who resides within. Upon their initial arrival in the 16th century, European explorers were awestruck by the kingdom of Benin, which showcased magnificent cast bronze sculptures, grand palaces, and a city that stood on par with their own capitals in terms of splendor and magnificence. Unfortunately, in 1897, the Great Walls of Benin were destroyed by the British in the so-called Punitive Expedition. Much of the art looted at the time is still on display in the British Museum. Exemplifying the interaction of Europeans on West Africa, this salt cellar, or salt box, from the 15th to the 16th century was created by the Sapai people of Sierra Leone who resided near the coast and engaged in trade with the Portuguese. Known as the master of the symbolic execution, this intricately carved salt container stands around 17 inches high and is crafted from an ivory elephant tusk. Created for trade, the Portuguese often commissioned elaborate containers and utensils as impressive mementos of their adventures to bring back home. The artwork features an executioner on top of a spherical container adorned with decapitated heads. Inside the sphere contains the valuable salt, at the bottom, small stylized crocodiles are situated in between a male figure that wears a European hat and pants and a woman displaying chest scarification representing her indigenous African identity. In many African societies, figures with enlarged heads are associated with wisdom, which is considered the most esteemed characteristic one can possess. Carved in the 16th century, this ivory pendant mask from Benin continues to be donned by the Oba either adorning his chest or waist during ceremonial occasions. This pendant mask portrays a queen mother who gazes out with a serene expression, adorned with a crown depicting alternating human heads and mudfish. The human heads symbolically represent Portuguese traders and sailors who frequently visited Benin and at times helped the king to resolve diplomatic disputes with neighboring peoples. A close examination of these figures reveals that they wear round caps and possess elongated mustaches. The mudfish prominently featured symbolize the concept of immortality as they emerge vivaciously from the mud each year. The Queen Mother's brow exhibits two vertical marks that serve as shallow slots and once held inlaid iron pieces. The Yoruba people of Nigeria possess a distinct tradition of wood carving characterized by the use of unusually small proportions and almond-shaped features. 
This tradition is evident in the house post of Obembe Aleya, which serves not only as a literal support for the roof, but also conveys a symbolic reflection on the concept of support itself. Within this composition, we find a community elder seated in a folding chair, a woman carrying a baby on her back, and another woman employing a traditional gesture of respectful welcome by holding her breasts. These three individuals collectively embody the crucial roles of wisdom, nurturing, and hospitality, each representing essential qualities that contribute to the well-being of the community. The significance of the house post takes on greater depth when observed in its original context through a photograph from 1959 depicting the tomb of former Chief Lisa. The chief, known as the pillar of the community, was honored by placing these posts at the forefront of his tomb, bestowing added significance and respect upon his memory. Across the African continent, the veneration of ancestors remains a prominent practice as they are believed to provide ongoing assistance to the living, including ensuring the fertility of the land for bountiful crop production and aiding in successful hunts. In certain African societies, like the Fang and Kota, people safeguard the bones of their ancestors with containers protected by sculpted figures to prevent theft or damage to these cherished relics. In societies with kings like the Kingdom of Benin, the royal family keeps altars in which animal sacrifices are performed to show respect to the ancestors. The goal of these rituals is to ask the ancestral spirits to protect the people and ensure prosperity. For centuries, the Kalabari Ijaw people have relied on hunting and fishing in the eastern delta of the Niger River, situated in present-day Nigeria. Similar to numerous African cultures, the Kalabari community holds great reverence for their ancestors, dedicating considerable attention to their memorials. However, these shrines take on a distinctive form due to the significant role that trade plays in society. Trading organizations, referred to locally as canoe houses, hold a central position in their community. Elaborate screens crafted from wood, fiber, textiles, and other materials serve as Kalabari ancestor shrines. One noteworthy example is the impressive Induin Fubara, or foreheads of the deceased, which stands at almost four feet in height. These screens honor a former chief of a trading company and are typically commissioned by the chief's family on or around the one-year anniversary of his passing. Displayed in the house in which the chief lived, the screen represents the deceased himself at the center, holding a long silver-tipped staff in his right hand and a curved knife in his left. His chest is bare and drapery covers the lower part of his body. His impressive headdress is in the form of a 19th century European sailing ship, a reference to the chief's successful trading business. Positioned on either side of the central figure are the attendants, intentionally depicted in smaller proportions to reflect their subordinate status. At the upper section of the screen, the heads of the chief's slaves are prominently displayed, while the heads of conquered rivals occupy the lower portion. The hierarchical arrangement and stylized representation of human anatomy and facial features are recurring features in African art, yet the richness and intricacy exhibited in this particular shrine are exceptional. The Fang and Kota peoples residing in Gabon and Cameroon have a tradition of honoring their ancestors by gathering cranial bones and other relics. These items are carefully collected and preserved within specially designed containers referred to here as reliquaries. These portable reliquaries were particularly suited for the mobile lifestyle of African nomadic communities such as the Fang and the people in the area of the Kota. Fang relic containers were safeguarded by stylized, carved, wooden human figures, sometimes appearing as heads alone. These guardian figures, known as bieri, were specifically crafted to sit on the edge of cylindrical bark boxes that housed ancestral bones. Their purpose was to ensure the protection and well-being of the ancestral spirits held within. The Bieri sculptures exhibit a symmetrical form with a pronounced emphasis on the head, and they display a rhythmic progression of shapes that exude a sense of contained power. Notably, the proportions of the Bieri bodies are striking, resembling those of an infant. Although the muscularity of the figures implies adulthood, scholars suggest that this combination of traits was deliberately chosen by Fang sculptors to convey the cyclical nature of life. The people of Gabon also crafted guardian figures known as Koda reliquaries or Mbulu Ngulu. In this region, people practice slash and burn farming, clearing land for cultivation. 
After five to seven years, the soil became infertile, forcing the community to relocate to new farming areas. Because of this, ancestral graves were inaccessible, leading people to carry a small part of their beloved family members with them when they moved. These reliquaries provided a connection for the living to their deceased family members. These figures are markedly different from the Fang Bieri and feature severely stylized bodies with simplified heads, flattened hairstyles, and intricate geometric ridges and borders that give the work a textured elegance. The bottom section takes the shape of an open diamond below a wooden head covered with sheets of polished copper and brass. The copper alloy found on the majority of these figures consists of reworked metal originally sourced from European brass basins that were traded into the equatorial African region during the 18th and 19th centuries. The figure's lower portion was then inserted into a basket or box of ancestral relics. The reflective metal aimed to imitate the shimmering appearance of water, symbolizing the perceived boundary between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. It was believed the gleaming surfaces repel evil. For a very long time, Europeans and Americans have struggled to move away from the colonial beliefs surrounding African peoples, and specifically the Coda reliquaries. We now recognize that these artifacts are deeply rooted in religious faith and possess exceptional aesthetic qualities, pursuing different objectives than European and American traditions. Evidence of this misunderstanding can be found in the term Coda itself. While we refer to these objects as Coda, they were not actually created by the Coda people themselves. Instead, they were crafted by neighboring communities residing in the same region as the Coda. We continue to use the term due to its widespread usage in textbooks, publications, and scholarly works. Among scholars, the term Coda is considered a colonial misappropriation. However, this serves as a poignant reminder of the lingering influence from the colonial era, which often obscures our understanding. During the time these artifacts were collected, the people of Gabon had recently embraced Christianity on a large scale. They rejected the reliquary guardians and the sacred bundles beneath them as a demonstration of their new faith. Colonial officials, local individuals seeking profit, and Christian missionaries took the opportunity to acquire these reliquary guardians and sold them in Europe. Within this framework, these works were portrayed in Europe as evidence of a savage and primitive belief system. It's important to remember that earlier testimonies and perspectives predominantly stem from a colonizer's viewpoint rather than those of the artists, the patrons, or those from within the culture itself.